here. Oh, wait, they're so small. I can't, I can't, on this side, I can't make them bigger either. Is it better, should I leave one? Is it better if I do that? Lights off? Oh, okay. Okay, I don't know if we even need to do this one. We've talked about a couple of these. <laughs> you tell me. Is that, uh, we know how to handle these, right? These are just ones where they don't give us the integral, but they're telling us they're defining areas of under curves. Oh, I guess I cut that off. That's not good. That's supposed to be a 4, and that's supposed to be a 7. Okay. Does that make sense? Does everybody know how to do those? Yeah. Well, sure. <clears throat> yeah, from four to seven. How are we going to go from four to seven? Okay, so if we know we know the area under f of x from two to four, and we know the area under f of x from two to seven, how could we manipulate that to find the area under f of x from four to seven? Just like travel. Let me ask you this. How could I do it? How could I link the limits in such a way that I could answer negative two? The answer is negative two, you're saying? No, I'm lying. <laughs> oh. Um, how, could I, how could I set this up as a sum of, of definite integrals so that the upper and lower limits end up giving us that result? Because remember, what I really have to do, what I, we, have a, we have a property. We have a property that says this. If I go, remember this F, uh, integral of f of x from a to c plus the integral of f of x from c to b, right? Notice the upper limit of the first is the lower limit of the second. Right. So in other words, if I'm adding up this area, what this is just saying <clears throat> is that wherever I leave off here, I start here, right? And so I'm just linking those two, I'm just pushing the two areas together, so to speak, right? Because that's just equal to integral of f of x from a to b, right? How can I do that here? <clears throat> See it again? Uh, the integral of 42. Ah, OK, good. Everybody see that? We could do this. We could just say the integral of f of x dx from 4 to 2 plus the integral of f of x dx from 2 to 7. See the trick? What have we done there? Well, we've actually just gone backwards, but that's okay. If we go backwards, we're just negating the area, right? So what is the answer to this one? If the integral of f of x from 2 to 4 is 6, what's that equal to? Negative 6. Yeah, negative 6 plus negative 6 equals negative 12. <clears throat> Make sense? Okay. Any other ones up there you want to see? Those are all. Any of those? You want to see? Can you see what those are? Integral of the of g of x minus f of x from two to seven. Just do that. Just split those into two separate ones, right? And if I have an eight, I just pull the eight out front. Okay. <clears throat> sure. Go back to this right here. Yeah.
Instructions were <clears throat> find the indefinite integral. So that's just an antiderivative, right? How do we do that? What's your thing for the kids? Just break them up into Yeah, we break them up into, we'll just integrate term by term. So what's this first one going to give us? What's the antiderivative of 3x to the fourth? x to the 5, <coughs> 3x to the 5th over 5, does that make sense? Power rule. The second one here, it's another power rule, isn't it? I've got the negative 4, which it looks, which is a constant out front. What do I do with the x to the minus 5? Good, you add 1. And sometimes people want to do x to the negative 6 there, but it's not, is it? If we add 1, it's x to the negative 4. So I get x to the negative 4 over negative 4. And that actually become positive? Yep, it would, right. So then the 4s will cancel, and that would become a positive. Good. And then finally, we get this trig derivative, or antiderivative, I should say. What's the anti? What derivative of what is secant squared? Yep. Am I done? Plus C, good. Got to have the plus C. And so we could clean that up, right? We could do one more little step there where we just make that 3 fifths x to the fifth. The fours cancel. That becomes a, a plus. And probably, we, you know, I mean, this is depends on the situation. But typically, we like to write variables with uh, positive exponents. So how would I make that positive? Yeah. <coughs> in both terms, so let's factor that out. Whoops. Oops. So what's that leave me with? I'll factor out a negative 5. Okay, how do I probably want to write square root of x if I'm going to anti-differentiate? And I forgot something. Definite integral. Good. Okay, so we're going to leave that negative 5 hanging out front. Antiderivative of x squared. three halves, but we just say times two thirds. And do I put a plus C? No. No. What do I do? It's a definite integral. So you just want to evaluate from zero to one. Yeah, good. Evaluate from zero to one. Right. Uh, now, what's going to happen at zero? It's just going to be 
everything goes away at zero, right? So then doesn't this just become, if everything goes away at zero, I just get negative five times. At one, I just get one third plus two thirds. And then minus zero. So that's it, negative five times one, negative five. Okay. And remember, that's a definite integral. I mean, we're getting an area under the curve, so we're getting back a number. That represents that area, right? Okay. Okay, yeah, here's another one I, I, I wanted to take a look at. We would want to find the, the area of the shaded region. Okay, and there's something. You got to be innovative on this one. Okay, take a second. Suggestions. What do you think? Walker, you got an idea? Perfect. Yeah, we got to we got to uh, think of this as two separate pieces, don't we? Because the area is defined by two different curves, right? We're transitioning from this this parabola at this point right here at the intersection. We move from the parabola to this line, and so we got to break this up into pieces. We've got this piece. Kind of over here, and then we got this piece over there, right? So somebody define that as, as two different integrals for me. Then, so the total area. What's the first definite From integral? Zero to, two. zero to two. Good. We're looking at the x values, aren't we? Zero to two. Yeah, I'll just put the three out front. How about right? Take a 12 out of that. And I don't know if we even need, I'll, we probably don't need to finish that. that. That's the main thing I want you to see there is that you have to, have to split this up into two pieces. Okay, I got another one I want to throw at you just, just while we're talking about this. And we'll get into this more in the very near future. But what would you do about something like this? Say we wanted to do Did everybody see that? Okay, this is a classic case where we're going to find the areas by subtraction. I could find the total area under the blue curve, right, if I went all the way down. And if I subtract away the area under the red curve, that's just leaving me with the green, isn't it? Right? So I've just got the integral of of x minus g of x over my interval to a to b. Okay. Make sense? All right. And we'll be doing more with that real soon. Okay. Easiest one on the whole assignment problem. Really. And just remember what we talked about the other day. This is the second fundamental theorem. Okay, now, why is kind of funny there, right? Look at why. Why is this area function? OK, 
Can anybody kind of remind me how that works? What is this? The part I'm interested in is I've got an X there, and I should probably have those in parentheses, and I've got those <coughs> T's right there. What does that mean? Can anybody describe what kind of animal that is? That's a weird one. What's that? No, no, no. This is it. This seems to be an easy one. So what this area function is doing, we're just adding up, x is the variable of the area function. We could think of this as being something like that, right? The upper limit, wherever we choose to stop adding up the area, is what's defining the area, isn't it? Starting at 2 pi, and this is, the, this is the curve, whatever that looks like. This is the curve under which we're adding up area. So if we were to draw a picture, I don't know what that curve looks like, but pretend it looks something like that. If we're starting at 2 pi and we're ending up here at x, then that's the area that we're adding up. As x increases, the area increases. How much does it increase? Well, that's determined by the curve, right? Okay. So it's a weird kind of an area function. But most importantly here, when you see problems like this, you just you're thinking, great, because they're so simple. What do you do to, to, to get the answer? What's the second fundamental theorem tell us we can do here? If we're trying to find dy dx, if this is y, what did that second fundamental theorem tell us we can do? Do you remember that one? It's pretty new stuff. Now, you probably, not only a lot of people have maybe even done this part of the assignment yet, so I can see why this is real fresh in your minds. Remember, the second fundamental theorem said that the derivative with respect to x of the definite integral from some constant to f of x of, and I guess it's g of x in there. simple ones like this, if g of x is just x, what's g prime? One. One. Yeah. So all we have to do is just plug x in for t, right? That's it. We're just going to evaluate the integrand at x. So the answer is, yeah, the answer is just 5 minus sine x over 4 plus cosine x. Done. Questions on there? I thought we were done with these, but I want to make you just do a couple here just to kind of make sure that you've gotten to the point where you're comfortable with them. Okay? So what do we do with this here? We're trying to, we're going to use a Riemann sum, pre-trick calculus, right? So we don't have our definite integral trick, fundamental theorem of calculus. <coughs> Instead, we're just, we're going to have to set this up in terms of a limit of a, of a sum, right? Uh, so that we're looking for the area under the curve f of x equals x cubed from 0 to 4. Now, we can always write that as the limit of the sum of f of c sub i, right? c stands for convenience. So we're adding up rectangles where the height is determined by the value of the function at c sub i and the width is delta x. What is c sub i? What's always the most convenient place to, to, to find the rectangles, did we say? 
Top right. Good. And so C sub i then, what is this guy right there? C sub i. We always want to evaluate the function at how do we say the top right hand corner of each rectangle? F of what? Remember we got we gotta walk, we gotta start at the starting place, and we gotta walk to the right hand edge of the i sub interval. So how do we say that mathematically? Starting place, which is Zero in this case, right? And in general, we'd say A, right? We'd say A plus, how do we say I steps? I times delta X, good. And what is delta X? How do we know how big our steps are if we're taking N steps to, to cross our interval? What's the width of the interval? Starting at, well, zero in this case. Yeah, it would be zero. But normally, I would just say in general, I'm starting at A and I'm ending at B. B. So the width is B minus A. B minus A. How many steps am I taking? N. So delta X is the width of the interval divided by the number of steps. Right? And so this looks like A plus, uh, A plus uh, I delta X, right? So I'm going to get... I times B minus A over N. And then I know what delta X is. Now I can get specific here because I'm not going from A to B. They're telling me I'm going from 0 to 4, right? So for us, we can say that our delta X, if A is 0 and B is 4, delta X is what? 4 over N. Yeah. The width of the interval divided by N. Good. And C sub i for us is just 0 plus 4i over n. Okay, and I want to make sure everybody, I'm going to pause there. And please, if you have questions, that's not making sense. This, this, this is a great time for us to kind of wrap, you know, wrap this up with some finishing touches on this old stuff. If there's any questions, hang me out there. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So there's C sub i. So that's what we're putting into our function. What's our function? X cubed. So if we combine all that stuff then, F of C sub I just equals junk cubed, right? Whatever we're putting into it is being cubed. And what we're putting into it is just 0 plus 4i over n, right? That makes sense? So all that stuff, that's what goes right there. And that's just delta x. Right? So then we got to fill in the blanks here. So inside that box, here I'll, I'll color code these. Inside the red box, that's saying f of what? Well, f of that. 4i over n. Right? What goes in the green box? That's just delta x. So the green box is, well, this is delta x, right? 4 over n. Good. And then I've got a, then it wants me to, to take the sum of all that stuff, right? So that's, if we want to define the blue box up here, what are we taking the limit of if I do all my algebra on that? use my summation formulas, what am I getting back? So I've got the limit of the sum of f of that, so that's going to be 4i over n cubed times delta x, 4 over n. So that's what I've got to simplify, right? I've got to take all this stuff in here turn that into you know, something simplified. So what are the steps I would do there? What's my algebra of sums that I can do? Break them up? OK. Uh, the only variable here is the i, isn't it? Right? 
So all the other stuff, I could just separate. I could even pull it out in front of the sum if I wanted, right? All the fours and the ends and all that stuff. And if I cube everything out there, aren't I just going to end up? Aren't I just going to end up with uh, four cubed is what? Sixty four. Sixty four over n cubed times four. Uh, boy, that's big, huh? Two fifty six. So two fifty six over n to the fourth times I cubed. Does that make sense? If I just took all the non I junk out in front of the sigma, so we can see the, the summation formula more easily. Right? And everybody sees that we just took this three and distributed it to all the parts. Yeah, do you remember what the what the summation? I think that's that's n squared, I think. Yeah, n squared times n plus one squared over four, isn't that the n? So it's n squared times over four, yeah. Okay, so we can take all this stuff and replace that with our summation formula. Which is n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. Good. Okay, so now we can do a little algebra. Look, I can cancel directly. I'm going to take the limit of this eventually as n approaches infinity. I can cancel n squared's top and bottom, right? And this is the part where working with people, you guys are doing a great job with this, by the way. Uh, but this is the part where I think people could could stand to maybe the algebra. I don't think you're seeing how to write this in the easiest way. So I want to, what I want to do here is I want to, I want to expand this out and I want to write this as a sum of fractions involving ends, but where the ends are all on the bottom of the fractions, right? So let's, if I expand this out, I can divide the four into the 256 and get 64. So I get a 64 on the top. If I expand this out, I'm just going to get n squared plus 2n plus 1, right? All over n squared. But this is the part that we want to build as a sum of, we want to split that into separate fractions. Because remember what our penultimate goal here is. We want to take the limit as n approaches infinity. And so we want to be able to have n's on the bottom of the fractions we want to be able to see that real vividly so we can see when those fractions are extinguished. Right? And when we take our limit, any fraction with an n on the bottom is going to shrink to zero, right? So we want to write this as a, as a sum of separate fractions. So what's that going to look like then? n squared over n squared is 1 plus 2n over n squared. And honestly, all we, all we really need to know there is that the bottom is going to have a bigger power of n, right? Even if we get that one, I mean, it doesn't even matter if we get the number part right on the top. We know that one's going to go away. And then 1 over n squared for our last one. And now if we take our limit, as n approaches infinity, we can see which of those fractions are extinguished, right? And so we're just left with 64. Make sense? <coughs> yes. Okay. So what goes where? Well, right here, this limit, the blue box would have been the stuff, right, well, it would have been this stuff, I would have had to include the 64 in there, but it's that stuff right there, isn't it? Or right here. That's probably even better, right? Then when we take the limit, when we take the limit is when that limit notation goes away once we evaluate the limit, and so our final answer is just 64. Okay? All right, that's an admittedly kind of tedious question, but it's important that we know how to do that. All right, this one we probably can skip.
get by that. Just tell me what I'm looking for here. Okay, what's my strategy? I'm just going to pull out the four, evaluate the antiderivative from pi to 2 pi. Do, do, do we want to do this one? Yes. Okay. I'm here now. Yes, let's do it. We'll do it. That's fine. This, this is a quick one. What's the antiderivative of sine x? Okay, there is something we can do here that's kind of cool. Uh, cosine, uh, negative cosine x from pi to 2 pi. One thing you could do, it's kind of inconvenient to have that negative hanging in there in the integrand. So we could pull it out front, that's fine. Or we could even do this. Explain this one to me. Right? If I add the area up backwards, that's changing the sign. Okay? And so I just get 4 times Cosine of pi, and if we look on the unit circle, what's cosine of pi? Negative 1 minus cosine of 2 pi is cosine of 1. So I get, yeah, so negative 8. Okay. And we didn't have to do that, by the way. You didn't have to. I mean, we would have been fine not doing that, too. But either way. Uh, average value. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, that's one of the other ones I want to make sure we did. Okay, average value of the function. Now, think back to the picture. This is one of those picture theorems. The average value of a function is what? How do we define that? Sure we had for that. This is a big. If we take, if we have some complicated function over some interval from a to b, if I grind that thing down and turn it into a rectangle instead of a complicated shape, then whatever the height of that rectangle is, we define as the average value. So all we got to do in terms of a formula, it's really pretty simple. We know that the average value of a function just equals the area under the curve divided by the width of the curve, right? So doesn't that give us the height? It's just the total area divided by the width. If you think of it as a rectangle. Okay. So for this one then, the average value Just going to be what? How would I define that? How would I write that expression? So it's just the area under the curve. In this case. Make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys can help with that. I mean, that's just, a, just another example of a definite integral. Okay. All right. Last statement. Okay, and this, yeah, this is probably another one. This really is not.
All they're asking you to do here is just break this up in, you know, just to demonstrate the procedure for doing a definite integral. So just generally speaking, if I've got the definite integral of some function of x from 2 to 3, what goes in there? The antiderivative, yeah, right, the antiderivative, because they're just asking you what function are we going to evaluate over the interval of 2 to 3, right? So that's just going to be the antiderivative. And then that's the answer, right? That's the actual area of the curve. So that's going to be a number, right? That's going to be a function. Make sense? Any, any questions you guys have on the homework? I mean, while we're here, we don't have a lot of time to go to the lab. are okay with, let me ask you this, are, are, are you comfortable solving uh, differential equations that have second derivatives? If you want to go through one of those, we get a second derivative with, with two pieces of two particular conditions. Okay. All right. Let's do one of those. Mike, you got something good going on there, or is that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> something like this. What if we've got first derivative, right? So if we anti-differentiate <coughs> both sides, we're going to get f prime of x equals that derivative, right? Anti-derivative of x to the negative 3 halves dx. Okay, so what is that? Right. Square root over 2. Okay, so I'm going to get x to the negative one-half divided by negative one-half is the same thing as times negative two, right? 
bus C. We'll call it C1. We're going to get a bunch of different C's here. Aren't we? So there's our first, and this is what we call right the general solution, right, for F prime. But we have a particular condition that's defined in terms of that first derivative, right? So if that's what F prime of x is, well, I know F prime of 4 equals 2, right? So if I evaluate this at 4, I should get 2 as an answer. So negative 2 times 1 over square root of 4, because that's just that's the square root on the bottom, right? Plus C1 equals 2. Okay, well, that's just negative 2 over 2. So that's negative 1 plus C1 equals 2. So what's C1? Okay. So I can plug that back in. And now we're got a new problem. Now we've got the first derivative. So f prime of x then equals negative 2 x to the minus 1 half plus 3. Okay, so that's one step. Now we've got to undo the first derivative to get f of x. So if we do that, what's the antiderivative of that guy? So I get x to the positive one half. Okay, good. Times two, but I already have a negative two out there. Right? So I get negative 4. Is that part? Everybody good with that? Yeah. Okay. And then the antiderivative of 3. Good. Plus some other C. And we have another condition. We know that the func value of the function at 0 is 0. Right? So, so if I plug 0 in for x, f of 0 just equals 0 plus 0 plus C2. And that's zero, right? So that's our answer, isn't it? Right on. Okay, good. All right. Have a great weekend. Yeah, I'll start the